Um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, great, okay. So I'm going to talk about game theory tonight. I'm going to assume, how many people know a bit of game theory? Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm going to try not to say anything actively that you will recognize as wrong. Um, and I'm going to try to convey a little bit of intuition, and a little bit of math here and there, not too much, for those of you who know very little. Uh, mostly I'm going to illustrate by examples. And so I'm going to talk about uh, a lab study using a very simple game, which we also, uh, I haven't, but colleagues have also used to study um, brain imaging, and then a field experiment, a field study, not an experiment, a, a game run by the, uh, in Sweden that illustrates game theory, a lottery choice game. Then we'll talk about movies and finally something fun. And so when uh, a game is a mathematical object, which consists of players choosing strategies given information, the combination of all their strategies, each player's strategies affects the others in some way. It may be kind of competitive or it may be cooperative and helpful. And all those strategy choices given the information yield outcomes. And the outcomes aren't always numbers. They may be territory in a war, um, uh, fitness in, the, in a biological genetic context, dollars for profit. But, the, uh, or, but often there are things that aren't numerical, but they're things we have values for. We call those values utilities or subjective values. And so strategic thinking has to do with reasoning about what other people would like you to do. Well, we'll talk about people tonight, mostly, exclusively. But game theory is also about genes to nations, making policy decisions, and so on. So part of why game theory is so interesting is it can work at lots of levels of analysis that people are just in kind of the middle. Okay. And so um, uh, add to these two strategies. All those strategies create valued outcomes, as I said. And game theory is, tries to predict what people will do. And again, it's not just people, but I'm going to kind of split it most and talk about people until the end. And then I'll talk about something closely related to the sapiens. And there are two types of game theory, roughly speaking. If you study some game theory in your classroom, or maybe in an online course, or in, in high school, even conceivably, you probably learn about what's called ad game theory. And so this is a, a, what's called a solution concept. It's a particular mathematical restriction that says, Every player in the game has somehow figured out what other people are likely to do. And they figured out that other people figure out what they're likely to do, and so on. So this is, a, a, the word equilibrium comes essentially from sort of a physical concept like a resting point. So if you're at an equilibrium, you guess correctly what other people can do. There's nothing that you can learn, and people are optimizing. Um, but, as you'll see in numerous examples tonight, there's another branch of game theory, sometimes called, I'll call cognitive hierarchy, it includes a, a number of other mathematical sort of spin-offs in the family. And that branch of game theory focuses on the idea that not everybody has completely figured out what everybody will do. So you're going to see a lot of examples. But then you want to be precise, because as you'll see in several examples, um, the game theory, the equilibrium flavor of game theory, I'll use what's called Nash equilibrium from John Nash, we'll hear more about him in a minute, um, is very precise. It's a zero parameter theory. And so it makes predictions just from magic, from pure, purely from the force of the mathematical image that players have figured out and all players have made what all players do. So we need to substitute that with something that's scientifically competitive, which means it should be kind of parsimonious and kind of make predictions. We don't want anything to happen. We want to have some discipline about what's likely to happen. And I'll describe one brand of theory, and there's a bunch of other community theories. This is something we worked on, so I'm kind of proud of it. But it also has been tested at a number of levels, and now it's completely great imaging and other things. Okay, so here's John Nash. So the type of equilibrium concept I'm going to talk about, but again, without using this much math, is his beautiful 17-page PhD thesis. Uh, this is a picture from him at the movie premiere for a beautiful mind, which originally was a New York Times article about him because he had been schizophrenic for decades after the early part of his blazingly glorious math career. And then he's, he's schizophrenia kind of relapsed uh, in his 60s. This is his wife, Alicia. If you know the movie, she, she's played by this actress. And she plays a very important emotional part uh, in supporting him as a human and in the race. This is Brian Grazer, who's a colleague of Okay, so I'm going to talk about two games where we're just going to study choices. Just what do people pick? They're going to be numbers. One is called a beauty contest game. Another is called loopy. Lowest unique positive integer, Swedish lottery. I'll show you a little bit of brain imaging data. 
we'll talk about movie reviews, the cousins, and uh, oh, I'm going to skip Stan Lee tonight for the sake of time. Okay. Um, if we had a bit more time and there were fewer of you, I'm glad there's not. Uh, we would we could actually do this uh, with with money, but it takes a bit of time. So just use your imagination and play along. Well. Uh, this is the so-called beauty contest game. And in, the, in this game, you choose a number zero to one. And whoever's closest to two-thirds of the average of all the numbers is going to win a fixed prize. Okay? And uh, you can think of this as a game in which the numbers are something like maybe when you can enter a growing market or something. And so you, you, don't, you, you don't want to enter with the average person does. You want to enter a little bit ahead of that. Like your number should be lower, but not necessarily too low. So you have to figure out what you think other people will pick knowing you're trying to pick two-thirds of what you'll pick and knowing that you know and blah, 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 blah. Okay? There are a lot of experiments on this. I'll show you a few in a minute. So think in your mind, uh, again, I'm sorry we don't have a bit more time and capacity to actually do this, uh, what number you would pick. Okay, numbers? 12. 20. 20? Anyone want to pick a higher number? 18? You stuck in a little bit of slides. <laughs> yeah, using to, to, to detect your rules. That's an interesting number. 60? 10? Would anyone pick zero? Zero. Zero? You will not win. <laughs> you have showed off that you either you probably know what the natural number is, which is zero. Or you may mistakenly think that that's actually what people will pick. In which case, you're kind of too clever by half. <laughs> so indeed, the mash will be zero. And the idea is, everyone wants to pick a number that's two thirds of what everyone picks. So if you imagine, for example, pick people picking, like, I don't know, they're gonna pick, let's say they're picking 50. Or a bunch of people are gonna pick randomly if the average will be 50, I'll pick 33. But in equilibrium, if you think everyone will pick 33, you should pick 22. Because you have to guess correctly. And if everyone picks 22, you should be two thirds of 22, which is around 15. Right? So sorry, it's a little past you. But don't, don't, okay, you'll be at a hero in a minute. Um, <laughs> and the, this resting point process of correctly predicting what people pick, knowing that they're correctly predicting, it does not stop, which is when the acceleration occurs, until you get to zero. And this is a unique Nash equilibrium. So in other games, there sometimes are multiple Nash equilibrium. That can lead to things like tipping points and so which are really interesting. But in this game, there's a unique prediction, and unfortunately, it's sort of on the boundaries, the lowest possible number. So we're going to show why that's kind of silly. That's a description of what happens when people play one time. But it's not worthless, and I'll explain why. Okay. So here are some two experimental data sets. These were, were done by me and collaborators in um, Singapore. Uh, and these are Singapore, mostly science engineering students. So this is the equilibrium prediction of zero. And again, that's a kind of extreme prediction. So that prediction can only, you can only be wrong in one direction. So uh, I don't think we should be too harsh on this extreme prediction. It's telling you something about the logic of this process. And the data are in maroon. So you can see that sure enough, there's a lot of people 50. Here's a 33. There's a little fewer. There's a few people with zero. They do not win. Right? And the reason is that I think the average number here is around 30, and the winner is around 20. And this is the prediction of another theory that I'm going to talk about in more detail called the Cogu divider. And 1.5 means if people are doing one, on average one or two steps of iterated reasoning, this is the prediction they would pick. And the idea is that these kind of cyan or sea foam colors, if I'm using LLB catalog language, uh, are pretty close to the data. And they capture the basic tendency, which is the numbers are too high. They're, more like, they're not like zero, they're more like 20 or 30. And there's a couple of spikes corresponding to a couple of steps in this thinking about what other people think about what people think. Okay? This is 4,000 observations from uh, uh, Spanish, English, and German business magazines. And if you collect all those observations, you see that, except for the spikiness and so on, the numbers are pretty similar to these Singapore students. Uh, sorry about this misalignment. I need to fix this graph. But you can see there's a bunch of 33, 
another spike at 22, and then there's various little ones, and then there are a bunch of people picking one. The average is 23, so the winner there is about 15. Okay. The New York Times did this game a few years ago. Kevin Queeley emailed me and said, we've heard about this game, uh, we're gonna try to do it in the New York Times. So they have this interactive interface, and when I logged on, after 55,635 people had been guess with my son, who was then about nine years old, we typed in our guess, which was 20. And it turned out the average of all guesses at that point had been 28, and so the winner was the closest to two thirds of 28, which was 19. So it's just barely off. Just barely. I mean, if I had cheated, I would have won. And my son did want to cheat. Let's log on and do it again. So if you log on and do it again, it recognizes your IP address and says, oh, we, we already have their answer. You know, Thanks for corresponding with us again. You're not going to cheat us. Anyway, so our little um, behavioral day theory lab, me and my little one work pretty close. And you can see very much like, with, again, this is a lot of data. So the beauty of so many 55,000 people instead of 72 students is you can kind of see the spikes and trends really pretty clearly. There's a big chunk of people like 50. Right? They're not doing much of the thing, right? That, you know, if you pick 50, you're not using the number two thirds in any way, right? And like, I'll just pick a number. What you guess? Not so lucky. Um, and then there's a bigger spike at 33, another again at 22, and then you see the smaller ones here. And we think what's going on is if you've gone from 33 to 22, you've done kind of two steps of thinking. You don't necessarily stop at three. You often, there's like a, a momentum, cognitive momentum in that process, and then you often remember the okay. more. And another beautiful thing, although I, can't, I don't have the graph, is the New York Times recorded response times. So how long did it take you between the time you got logged in and then you typed in your number? And that's pretty cool because we might think that the lower numbers are using more iterated reasoning, and that takes longer. And sure enough, the response time distribution uh, is flatter over here. It's pretty quick for 50. And then it gets higher and higher and higher. So lower numbers, which are closer to equilibrium and more likely to win, take longer. And we see that in quite a few other lab studies. It's just it's, it's beautiful to see it. This is the golden age of social science because you have New York Times doing really good experiments for you. <laughs> That's not a random sample of people, but neither are Singaporean students or Caltech students. Um, and it's nice to see really large scale data you could do a lot of other things. Okay. This is Reinhard Zelton. He shared the Nobel Prize with John Nash uh, in 1994. And Nash's uh, idea is sometimes called a circular concept. I'm going to pick, we're all going to pick strategies, which are best responsive to strategies we don't pick. And so if you write down an equation, the strategies are on both sides of the equation. The strategy is a solution to maximizing expected values given the strategies. And so that requires what's called a fixed point, mathematical argument. And when John Nash at Princeton went into John von Neumann's office in the uh, 40s, and John von Neumann and Morgenstern had written this classic book about game theory, theory of games and economic behavior, and Nash said, I, have, I think I have a general solution for games. And this solution was not in their 500 page book. They didn't follow it. And by knowing that committee was a bit of a snob, I don't know, a little backstory, said, oh, that's just a fixed point. And that, that just a fixed point argument was Nash equilibrium, which has been enormously useful in economics, also in biology, increasingly in political science, a little bit in sociology. And Zelton to add a different way to go, because Zelton was much more interested in what people actually do. And John Nash was a mathematician. So he was interested in, so that's why he used the word solution. Right? It's like a solution to the game. That's what I'm saying. I have a solution to your marriage. Right? You know, normally you think of that as a mathematical problem. Um, and so what Zelton said was the natural way of looking at games is not a circular concept. He means this Nash equilibrium of I think, they think, I think until we get a resting point. But rather on a step by step reasoning procedure. Okay. And so we and others took this idea seriously. And the cognitive hierarchy theory works like so. This, there's zero step thinkers who are not strategic. And we think they choose something salient, like a lucky number. Like in the New York Times, you see a lot of 50s. It's like in the middle. Um, in most prenatal original PhD thesis, 
somebody picked 18 and won the game? Is it because they were as smart as you and were given two and a half steps of iterative reasoning? No. It's, and, and her, in her thesis, which she said, there's a region where she asked people, why do you pick the number they picked? And the person who picked 18 went, oh, that's really clever. You won the contest. I'm 18 years old. Right? <laughs> so they got the right answer for the wrong reason. OK, so the zero step players choose something salient. If there's nothing that's pretty salient, they'll say they choose equally among different numbers. Uh, the one step thinkers think that they're playing zero step players. Right? So if salient is 50, I pick 33. The two step thinkers think they're playing zero step thinkers or one step thinkers. And three step and four step. And mathematically, we find that typically, if you, go, you don't need to go beyond four or five steps, typically. And that's actually very difficult in terms of working memory. You know, if you've ever read any like complicated um, books about relationships, like Jane Austen or spy novels, you know what somebody thinks somebody, what Jane knows that Alexandra knows that Alec knows can get very complicated and tax and working memory. And so the next question is, well, what's the percentage of these different types? The zero steppers, the one step, the two steps. And we don't think this is, of course, like a universal constant, but it would be handy as a first pass if. Um, some of these, the, these distributions were similar across different games. So we could take like Singapore data and predict something about the New York Times. Okay, or we could take something, as you'll see later, we could take something from the two thirds of the average type game and predict something about a lottery that was conducted 15 years later in Sweden. <coughs> and so uh, what we use mathematically is a Poisson distribution. Poisson is cool because it has a fun French name, to use fish from the mathematician Poisson, and it uses E, so it looks very scientific, E. It has this cool mathematical form. The Poisson distribution says, uh, if you have an average thinking steps of tau, then the percentage of people doing k steps, 0, 1, 2, 3, you know, has this kind of distribution. So if you think tau is around 1 and a half, which is a number we often see from different data sets, you can see that there's a, quite a few level zeros who are not thinking like eight minutes. There's level ones who think they're playing these sort of naive players, and then level twos think they're playing people who think they're playing people. So they're really thinking much more strategically. Okay. Uh, and so just to remind you, in, the, in your time data, here's the level ones, here's the level twos. Okay. All right, on to Sweden. Um, in, uh, if uh, if uh, Robert Ostling calls up, and actually over to Weeble and some other Swedes we know, who have that as a country that's very much strong in game theory and in experimental in a lot of important areas. And they say, Robert Austin wants to come visit the tech program. He has a scholarship, he might have pay anything. You say yes. And so he came, and after he uh, left, he emailed and said, you know, I have this data set from this weird lottery you want to analyze it together. And the way the lottery works is this is an actual card that you could fill out. So you go to a little office. This is the day to go back, I think, to 2005 or something like that, uh, or 2007. You go to this office and you fill out. Each of these allows you to submit one number as an entry into a lottery. So on this card, you can fill in six different numbers. And you pay one euro for each entry. And the lowest unique number, lowest unique positive integer, the numbers go from 1 to 99,000 because that's how many fit on the card. The most unique number wins 10,000 euros. So this is the kind of experiment we can never really do in lab, because 10,000 euros is a lot of euros, and we can never get as many people participating. And so whenever you know an organization like the Swedish Lottery Commission does something we can analyze with game theory, that's really cool. That's, and so we got these data, we were very easy to get. And again, the rules are you choose a number from 1 to 99,999, and the lowest unique number wins. Now, it's not hard to think about how to pick a low number. You don't need to be strategic. One's the low, lowest value. What's the lowest number? Out of ones? One, next lowest. Two, three, okay. That part's easy. Unique is strategic. Right? You have to pick a number nobody else is going to pick, knowing everyone's trying to pick a unique number. And so, this is a cool game because it has these two cognitive forces. One is easy to go low, and what is hard to be used, right? And again, we have uh, 
just kind of coincidentally, we have about 55,000 observations here per day of people playing this lottery over the over the seven weeks. So we can see what do they do. And we can also see that they have a TV show in Sweden, and every night on the TV they show, they show the numbers. They count down from 99,999, and they stop every time there's a unique one. And they, and they show you know if you want. And so we can see after seven weeks of playing, do they kind of converge and move toward the national movie prediction? And first I have to say what the national movie prediction is, which turns out to be, um, if you put together Robert Osling and Joseph Wong and Eileen Chittle, and um, I boss them around. Um, these guys are the math wizards, and they uh, figured out the national <coughs> which turns out to be incredibly complicated in sort of an interesting way, but not, it's not something most of you would find interesting, or few of you would. So you can read on a paper about this, which has a lot of interesting But it turns out that the solution is the following. If, if, and it turns out you can't solve this numerically if there's a fixed number of people playing. Like if you know there's 55,000 people, it's impossible to compute. Now, are there any computer scientists here? There's a good chance a computer scientist will email me tonight, camera at caltech.edu, okay, or Twitter, CF camera uh, Twitter, and say, oh, I, I think I can solve this. I'll email you in the morning. And don't say tomorrow morning. If you say the morning, it's the morning of infinity. Because and, and if you know something about computation, you might, you might have an intuition because to solve uniqueness, you have to do these complicated combinatorics, right? Like if three is unique, it's because one was not unique, at least one person picked one, and at least one person picked two, but nobody other than you picked three, and when you start to solve that for 99,000 numbers, it could, could be comes on compute. But, thank you guys, might be French, if the number of players has a distribution, like different numbers of players, because the, you know, about the same number of people every day, some people play a lot, and some people don't. If the distribution of the number of players is what's all distributed, it's just a coincidence that it's the same puts on, um, then you can solve for the Poisson national thing. And the revelation here came from an amazing uh, scientist called Roger Myers, who also won a Nobel Prize for his work. Not this particular work, but for other really beautiful elements of that path of nature. And so the way you solve for the frequency the equilibrium is going to be a mixed equilibrium. Mixed means not everyone picks the same number, obviously. And so there's going to be a mixture in which the, the people in the population, on average, choose one the most frequently, because that's low. Two is a little less frequent, because it's a little less low. Three is less frequent, and so forth. And so the, the equilibrium distribution is going to be a distribution of how frequently each number is picked for all of the possible numbers. It's going to be a very complicated function. And you get it by solving this equation. So the percentage of people picking one and the percentage of people picking two are, are in, linked in this way, where n is the mean of the number of people playing. And the same with p of three, the same with p of four, and so forth. You have this complicated series of simultaneous equations. You call the rubber Russell and Joseph Wong and say, please solve this, and you know it's be on Slack. And n days later, you get an answer, which is this. So the, the, the distribution has an interesting property. This is numbers from 0 to 10,000. And it turns out, this is the, the first part of a little bit of fancy math. I'll, I'll take you by the hand and go through it. It turns out that the function starts at its maximum at 1. So the most common number should be 1. Then 2 is a little less common. It goes down. 3 is a little less common. It's concave, which means it's accelerating, right? So rate of dropping from one, two, three, is, 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 you know, it's like if you put a marble on that hill, it would pick up speed, right? Until it hits 5,517, and then it becomes basically zero. Where does 5,517 come from? The magic of Poisson as you're moving. It just comes from nature. So now we kind of went like teasing the game theory prediction of zero and the truth of the average game, right? This is ridiculous. How would human beings in a big group in Sweden? And by the way, the Swedish group designed the lottery. One of them had been a game theory student of Mark Duferberg. Nobody had solved these equations until we did. And um, it has a weird shape, right? Because basically it means 
most of the numbers from one to 5,000 are about equally chosen, and then there's a sharp drop. Like 55, 18, no, no, 55, 5,500. Like why, how are you ever this distribution? You might say this is a trick question. You know it's gonna actually turn out the way you're trying to get us to be skeptical. But maybe I'm trying to get you to not be skeptical. Maybe, and I think the fix is it's gonna come close. Okay, a few of you. Who thinks it's gonna be really different? Uh, the answer is some of both. Let's see. So in week one, when you plot the numbers, if you plot numbers from they can go up to hundred thousand. When you plot the numbers, this is the input on actual number. It's at a different scale, that's why you this. And remember, one of the predictions is you should never see any numbers above 5,500. Now, first of all, why did they make this card? So you can go up to 100,000. Because they did not know the natural number. If they had asked us, well, I would have said, print, you don't really need to print cards up to 7,000. So they wasted a lot of numbers. But that's actually good, because the game theory says, this is what they should pick. They should not pick 95% of the numbers. And they hardly ever do. Sometimes, sometimes. And the most common number, this is a line at, um, at uh, I think it's, a, oh, oh, this is a line at 10,000. So in a minute, I'm going to blow up the 10,000 part and show you just what the lowest 10,000 is. And it's here. So again, the, the shape is changing because it's like an accordion, right? You started with just up to a few thousand and then up to 100,000 and then back to 10,000. So here's the question on actually the reproduction. And there's two features. There's too many low numbers. There's not enough numbers in here. So most of the winners you could kind of use the state there to actually win the game a fair amount. Because most of the winners come in around two or three thousand. Which is numbers that should be picked pretty often and they're just not. People just think they're too high. Um, and notice that the most common number, about 150 people in this first week, picked one. Now again, one should be the most common, but it shouldn't be that common. Right? And here's what these people are thinking, right? One, that's the goal. No one else is going to think of one. <laughs> so they get the low part right, which is easy. And then they even get the unique part. It's like, do you think anyone else will think of one? No. <laughs> and, you know, and then, but a bunch of people are like, some idiot is going to pick one, thinking the only one. That's what I'm going to pick two. And a lot of people pick two also. So these low numbers are like in the low notes, but it's not going to be unique. Right? Okay, this is week one. Uh, can we explain this with cognitive hierarchy? First, a quick comment, which is, um, if you go into the lottery store, they actually, um, every, I think every, on a screen, they would show this every um, day. So this shows you the date, and what Limbonur, I'm guessing some Swedish, Limbonur, I think, is the lowest number. Um, or the, I think they call it the Limbo number, because they call this game Limbo. Limbo, the first one's 162. That is really low, that's weird. Then it goes up to 2,000. You can see it's moving around quite a bit. And, um, and they also have, here it says, Miss Frequent Spill and Guru Mo. 1, 7, 11, 13. Any guess what that means? Most frequently chosen number. And the most frequent number is 1, 7, 11, and 13. And these never win. But you can see people are making a little bit of an effort, right? So a lot of people are making like 13. That's not a bad guess. It's, again, it's, it's way too low. It's way too low. So there's 55,000 people playing. A bunch of them are going to pick 13. But at least they're kind of trying. And like, these are all prime numbers. right? So they're, they're looking for something that's kind of like weirdly unsalient or unusual. Okay. And so if we fit the kind of hierarchy model, that is, we ask, what value of tau, the number of steps of thinking, plus the kind of noise parameter, because people aren't per choosing numbers super perfectly accurately, can it explain the data? We get a top 1.80. That's pretty good because in the two thirds of the average games, we get numbers that like one and two. Even though totally different game, right? And you can see the main thing is the kind of hierarchy prediction predicts too many low numbers. It still under predicts, but it kind of it gets the, the, the deviations in the correct direction. And then it breaks the big gap here. Okay. Next up, what if you what if Swedish people play seven weeks in a row? And they have a poster and a TV show to tell them what the winner is each time. Can 
And now you can think about it in a different way. Most working game theorists think it's not that surprising that the first time people play, they won't pick a distribution over that fits this wild distribution with all these beautiful equations. Right? They're going to kind of pick an intuitive number that's low and maybe an 8 like 13, but the low numbers are never going to win. And they're going to see that you need to pick a number like 2,000 and they're going to move up. So maybe after a few weeks, the Poisson Nash prediction, which is way off and way off, is going to get better. And here it is. This is week seven. So remember, about 150 people picked one, two, three, those numbers. Now it's down to 50. Right. So all those people realized this is way too low. Right? You know, that wasn't unique. Oh, you forgot to tell me it was unique. What was the unique? It was just two things. Sorry that you missed one. And so the convergence process, it turns out that if you mathematically, if you look at a model that says, how are people changing the numbers to get better and better, the people with low numbers move up. And by week seven, it's really good. So I mean, here I want to kind of remind you, this is not my theory. Um, it's, it's Rogers and John Nash's. But the game theory is this pure math, zero free parameters, zero. right? And it makes a very precise prediction. It's really not obvious. It has a sharp drop in a weird spot. And it's basically pretty accurate after seven weeks. Okay. So this is exhibit A in where a very strange theory, which is pretty implausible psychologically, happens to work if you play the same game 49 days in a row and you get a chance to kind of adjust and learn. OK. Uh, a little bit of brain theory. So this is a, one study by Carlos and Nagel. So they did the two-thirds of the average game. And the difference is instead of two-thirds, they used a bunch of different values on this multiply parameter x. So two-thirds is here. And so they, they did this with 20 subjects. Uh, and they divided about evenly uh, into a low-level group. The low-level groups basically picked, so this is two-thirds, for example. They picked two-thirds of um, the average. They picked around 25. That's similar to the data we saw before. But if the, if the parameter was a half, then they would pick half of 50, which is 25. The parameter was even lower. And so if you line up the dots, which are the um, when they're playing versus other humans versus playing a computer that's kind of a control. When you line up the blue dots, this group of people are basically picking p times 50. They're they're like level one players. They're not doing um, they're not thinking about what what the players are likely to do and response from each other. These are higher level figures. They tend to pick p times p times 50. Right. So that's like the 22s. Right. They're picking two-thirds of two-thirds of 50. So they pick 22. And now we're going to see when people are thinking, and they're having their brain scans using an fMRI scanner, what is going on differently in their brains when they're doing low levels of strategic thinking versus high levels of strategic thinking. And I should add, this is a paper from 10 years ago. The, the standards in neuroeconomics have improved a lot. People are using bigger samples. We have better statistical tools. So this is a pretty crude early study, but even then you can see there's going to be a sharp answer. So it turns out, if you look at what areas are active when people are playing another person, a human, versus playing a computer, this should require what's known as called theory of mind or mentalizing. Right? You know, what is it that another person like me is going to actually do? And you get beautiful activations. These are how, how different activity is, both a blood flow signal into these regions, when you're playing a person versus a computer, this is the, the medial prefrontal cortex, is basically here, um, lateral to the TPJ, temporal parietal junction. This is a beautiful map of what someone's called the mentalizing circuit. Okay. And if you look at the, the high level of reasoning people versus the low level, you know, what areas are the, the high level people using more of? <coughs> right? It's the it, you know, DMPFC. Right? As you can see, Alexander is. Got it. Figures spotted right on there. Okay. All right. And so this is this is just another way of seeing this graph. This is the percentage signal change, like in this region, relative to kind of a baseline when you play a human computer. There's a big difference for these people. No difference. For these and this is cool. So the kind of thing some people might want to do in economics is now we can say, look, this DMPFC activity is sort of a hallmark of strategic. Right? So, so you know, if you had a criminal, you said, 
do you do you realize the effect you would have on a person? Were you being negligent or were you like attempting murder? And if they're using mentalizing and thinking about another person, you might be able to see that signature in their brain. And this is obviously a bit of a science fiction scenario. But the idea is that once we know something about these brain areas, we can do a lot of interesting follow-up. Or we can say, for example, maybe nine-year-old children have less activity in this area, or three-year-olds, because they haven't learned to think about what other people like and what other people are planning to do. Or we can do causal experiments, like uh, Cheryl and Alex, Alex are doing here. We can, we can try to regulate with electrical activity. We can try to stimulate that area and see if people become more strategic. So we, we put electricity into the FTRC and we see if people pick one in the looping game. Now they're like, one of these two, because other people will choose one. They will not be unique. I'm mad. They're going to choose 2,513 and win. Right? So again, they, these, whether those things work and, and how you get them to work, usually it's a much longer story. But at least now we have a target region to look at. OK, on to movies. This is Eddie Murphy. You'll notice that his poster for the adventure of Pluto Nash all he says is Eddie Murphy and the title. He does not have any um, reviews or words like fantastic, best sense of one. And the reason is that uh, this is joint work with these folks, uh, that is that from 2010 to 6, 7% of the movies released, big, big 300 screen movies, like wide, or wide release movies, um, were not shown to critics in time to have a review of the newspaper. Now, the movie business has changed a lot. So newspaper reviews on Friday are no longer much of a big deal because there's all kinds of teasers and things that leak out. So the Friday movie review is not as big a deal as it was a long time ago. Um, but what we're going to be interested in is, are the moviegoers getting information from whether there's a review or not? If they're not, it's consistent with this kind of non-strategic thinking. They're not thinking, wait a minute. Whether something in review gives me information that the studio knows about quality. So we're going to see how that plays out. So here's two examples. My middle name is Farrell. I call the Farrell camera. So as you can see, something resembling in the name. This is a well-reviewed movie by Neil Jordan. And you can see that when this ad came out in a national newspaper, one of the things that was in it was blurbs from reviews. And they're pretty long. And the reason is that people, movie critics were allowed to see the movie like on Tuesday in order to get their review done and they send it to the studio and if it's, it's good, the studio takes a bit out and puts it on the poster. Okay. And, and so these are, the, whether there's a review at all and the number of words. So a lot of times you'll get a review that says, unusual. <laughs> right? And the review is like, it's unusual that the studio would even re re put this on screen. So it's not <laughs> right? Okay. So here's a movie called Killers with Captain Hagel and Ashton Kutcher. No reviews. No reviews. That's because they didn't like critics. You had a Metacritic rating of 21. This, Metacritic is a scale that goes from 0 to 100. Um, and we're going to use it to illustrate how naivete they were. So um, the 7% of movies from 2000 to 2006, what we call them cold open, which means they were um, not shown to critics and or they were not, and often, sometimes the, the papers used to hate this, right? So the New York Times or LA Times would have a little war, but it would say, um, Killers was not available for review in time for publication. Uh, we'll have a review tomorrow. And then they write the review tomorrow. So eventually these things don't get reviewed. You can't write it forever. Anyway, so here's a distribution of a few hundred movies, and the, and the Metacritic ratings average 20 or 30 different critics on a 0 to 100 scale. And you get that, a nice, beautiful, almost Gaussian belt curve distribution, right? So there's only a few movies in this time period that are in the 80 to 100 range. And they're usually kind of art house movies, or like The Departed was a high one. Um, and a pure movie that you might think of a few recent, very well reviewed. And then there's some 60s, the, most of them are in the 40 to 60 category. And the number that are pulled open is in red. So for movies that are above average, they're almost all shown to critics, and just one or two are not shown. Movies that are below average, remember our beloved pals, um, Ashton Kutcher and Catherine Hagel, theirs is a 21. <coughs> I get this, I talked about this a couple years ago in Taiwan. 
And I said, has anyone actually seen this? Somebody, yeah, somebody raised their hand. And I said, why, like, why did you go? Like, my wife wanted to go. <laughs> now we're divorced. <laughs>
of the variable is equals one. And if it's positive, that means the cognitive hierarchy is correct. If it's zero, that means Paul Rubin, the future Nobel Prize winner from next month, is correct. And so um, here's a bunch of dots. Each dot is a movie. This is the residual. It's basically that progression, except we left out the critic rating. So you can see that the dots go up with the critic rating. In other words, box office is higher when movies are better, as shown by critics. Not, it's not perfect, but the correlation is 0.6. You know, it's a kind of solid social science type of correlation. And the red squares are the cold movements. So first of all, again, you can see the red squares are all below 50. That's what we saw before. In other words, only the weakest movies, and there's a lot of them here. The red line is above the blue line. That means that this gap is the premium to cold opening, which is essentially how much moviegoers were fooled, how much they, they overrated the quality of the movie because they didn't think of what the movie story was trying to tell them. And it's about 15%. So if a box office opening for a typical, okay, movie like Killers might be 10 million, they made an extra million. <laughs> um, and the other thing that's neat about this is, um, is if you look at movie grosses in the UK and in Mexico, which during this time period typically happen after the US, like a month later, and so a little bit of information like, you know, gets across the border to Mexico, or crosses the uh, Atlantic Ocean, across the pond to England, and there the word has kind of leaked out of that quality, you don't see this cool because nobody has sort of tripped. And if you look at DVD rentals, which is after the movies off the screens, you don't see this. So it's, it's not that this just gap persists, it's only kind of in the beginning. Okay, so this is consistent with a model in which there's some naivete and there's some level zero thinkers who aren't thinking strategically what does it mean that there's no critics. Okay, final thing, uh, hide or seeker. So uh, a very important basic game, it's a simple game mathematically, but in an interesting and important game biologically and psychologically, is what's called matching games or hyperseeker. And so one example is a penalty kick, right, where a bunch of people have actually studied this, usually actual soccer scoring. And um, the idea is that if you divide the, uh, the goal into thirds, like middle, left, right, uh, a pretty good model for this game is that the kicker and the goalie each kind of choose one of the left and the right because they have very little time to react, so they kind of jump in one direction and you hope that you have the direction right. Um, so this is kind of like, it's a hide or seek game where there's three spots. And the hider is the kicker, because they, they want to choose a spot that's different whether this the goalie goes and the goalie is the seeker because he wants to go to where the ball is. Here's another example, uh, predator prey. There is a predator in this picture, it's a snow leopard. Some of you may have seen this, that would give you a little bit of perception advantage. Um, <laughs> I've got using this laser pointer finger. It's here. Okay. So this is, this, is a, this is not exactly an example of playing a game, but this is an example of nature having equipped the snow leopard, as well as obviously the snow leopard gene expression, to hide in this mountainous snow dotted and there's tons of those examples. Uh, here's some kids playing hide and seek. Okay. And, as you know, there's kids. Alexander, do you play hide and seek when you're little? Yes. Okay, so there's an N of one. We're gonna take that to be a sufficient statistic. Um, every kid goes through a phase of playing hide and seek. Other um, primates go through a longer phase of hide and seek because it's really kind of pretty biologically important to them to be able to hide and seek, whether it's predators or prey. So we're going to now study two interesting species. One is Homo sapiens, this is Charles Darwin. The other is Pantrogodite, which is chimpanzees. This is Pongo, orangutan. And it turns out that chimpanzees and humans share more genes, we only uh, differ by 1.3% of our overall genes, than zebras and horses. And these are our closest genetic cousins. And not only that, I think it's the case, there's been some recent work on this, because whether counting of how many genes are different, it's not clear that that's the most important way to get the biology. It depends what the genes do, right? But in any case, we're close to chimpanzees, and chimpanzees are closer to us than anyone else. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, first show you something. This is called a spatial memory hold test. 
I'll say a little about it, but just watch. The idea is you're going to see there's a five blanks. There are some called masks. You're going to quickly see digits from one to nine. Five digits from one to nine, so not always consecutive. One, three, four, or seven, eight, that are displayed for 200 milliseconds. The task the person has is to notice where the digits are and press them in descending order. Like if it's one, two, three, four, five, they should press one, and then two, and then three, and they're in different places every time. This is not easy, as you'll see. And if they, if they make a mistake, you get this like, five. <laughs> and if they get it right, you get this like, ding, 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 ding. Let's see how this human does. I'll say this. That's a success. Meanwhile, um, 
the hydro player, if they mismatch one L one R, right? That's like the kicker trying to um, kick the goal when the goal is not good. They get a path of one if they mismatch correctly, and otherwise they won't. And it turns out Nash, our friend John Nash, uh, has a very strange prediction here, which is if you change X, and suppose you max X equal to three, you would think that what happens is the player who's, who's in, in, um, the, in black letter, the row player, if X is three, would pick L one more. Right? Because they're going to get three. Not true. Because in equilibrium, the other player will guess that they'll pick L one more, and then they'll pick R, and they'll never actually get them. It's not just up to them whether they get the money. So it turns out if you change X, the Nash percentages with which you should play L and R are 50 50, completely independent of that value of X. So the player who gets the, change, the X value for matching on LL should not change the behavior. Because they need to go somewhere where they're going to surprise the other guy, and the other guy's not going to be surprised. But if you change X to 3, then the percentage of R choices by the uh, mismatcher goes up to 3 quarters, and this goes to 1. So the, the mismatcher should sort of mix away from the high payoff. And it shouldn't affect the person who may get the high payoff at all. So this is, again, one of the very strange, bold predictions of game theory, is that if you change the probabilities from one player, when they have this kind of mixture where you're trying to out guess the other guy and keep yourself from being out guessed, it should affect the player who does not actually get the money. Okay. So here's the final picture. This is I and you. Playing, and you're going to see a little clock score in the center. I pick left, I even pick left. So I win. The star means that I is the mom is trying to match. Match, 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 match. <laughs> so far, I should pick the blood from the, the little sun. <laughs> she's like hard work and he's like fooling around. shows them um, actually playing between each other. So um, since this game just has these two strategies, we can kind of show everything in a graph with the probability that the matcher player chooses right on this axis, zero to one, the probability that the mismatcher chooses right. And so each of these uh, symbols is one person's matching per right percentage choice with, when they're playing the matcher or the mismatcher roles, like we'll call them, okay? And this is the Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium for the, this particular game is that um, if you're a matcher, you should be 50-50, but if you're a mismatcher, you should be right or wrong. That corresponds to what X equals 3 in the matrix. And you can see these are the chips. The chips are really close to the Nash equilibrium. But by that I mean the, a few of them are not that close, but if you average them together as a group, as a species, the average chip is very, very close. Here's another species, Homo sapiens. So here's the Japanese, and then people were skeptical about our Japanese results, and so we, it turns out that um, in Mosul, um, West Africa, they have a chip, a, com a compound, a you know, reserve, and so they went, and the workers there are not very well paid, so we played this with some of the workers who work in the compound, and paid them a lot of money in terms of the local purchasing power, because it's a poor country, and it, it, it paid a lot of money to the people who work, in, the Africans who work in that comp the reserve, it's very similar to the Japanese. So these two human groups, even though they're quite different in education and where they live in the world and so on, are really the same, and they're different in chips. So 
So if you plot the three different games, we played three games that change the numbers each time. And remember, each time we change, the prediction is different. It should be that the, the hider is changing, but not the seeker. The chimps are incredibly close. Natural equilibrium is a square, data is a triangle. Square, triangle, square, triangle. So there's six comparisons, three games, and there's the two different kinds of players. Five out of six, they're within 0.01. This is actually the best evidence, the best performance of any species ever before. Now, with that said, it's only six chimps, and uh, the chimps do, do a lot more trials than the humans. But even, if you even compare the beginning of the experiment, like the humans do 500, and you look at the first 500 trials of the chimps, to another couple thousand. The first 500, they're very, it looks very similar. So the chimps are better at this game than we are. We think. And we think the reason is, according to Matsuzawa, is that the, they're, they're really important things that the chimps are born able to do and that they train when they're little. And um, one of them is physical combat, the status of the eel. They're, they're smaller, the, the smaller chimps, like Ayumu, is like that tall, like 65 pounds. He couldn't kill any of those people. Um, they're really fierce. And when they fight, uh, when I went there to Nagoya, they have this kind of compact but thick like gorilla glass. And I kind of went in, and he said, you know, the older males are going to like challenge you. And I was like, what does challenge me mean? And he's like, you'll see. <laughs> I'm like, I'm scared. I'm just like all in and out. Like, and so I'm standing there in like a lab coat, like, oh, I'm a male, I'm a sapien scientist, please don't kill me. And the chimps come over, like, boom, they bang against the glass. It was pretty funny. He's like, oh, they just, that shows they like <laughs> <laughs> So the chimps are physically stronger, so that's important in the world. And Mazzazala thinks that, you know, human kids quit playing hide and seek, and then they start to cooperate. Right? They have, like, tea party, or they cook, or they. It's like, well, our team is going to now play against your team, like talk of war, dodgeball, right? And when the humans are learning to kind of cooperate, the chimps are still learning to compete in heights. So it's like, they're probably better at it genetically. They can remember where people are, like the touch screen, whoop, 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 whoop. So they're actually better than us, we think, at this particular game. Okay. And um, let me end there. <laughs> <laughs>